That's that's in what? <laughs> Everyone I've played this to has had that exact reaction. Like just what? <laughs> I would have never in a million years been like, oh, this kind of sounds like. But no, that's just the same notes, I, just happier. I, I don't that's even crazy. remember how. Ladies, gentlemen, and those with the good sense to do away with the whole notion, I welcome you to the premier audio medium for all your Fazbear Entertainment needs. The Freddy Fazbear Pizza Podcast. Note, FFPP is not responsible for any loss of appetite, disinterest, dismemberment, or other legally classified statuses. So strap in and enjoy. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Freddy Fazbear Pizza Podcast. I'm your host with the Toast Right Toast here with a very special guest. Go ahead and introduce yourself. Uh, hi, I, I, I move troop. <laughs> Uh, that's perfect <laughs> leave troop even <laughs> uh i'm uh, this is uh funnily enough i didn't tell them but this is actually a very uh y- you are one of my most requested guests in the email really um i, I yeah you obviously matt pat and like i don't know who you think i am that i just can dial up my guy <laughs> but it's always been like every email that has requested people have been um either like someone i have no way of reaching out to um uh you funaf and uh i've gotten a lot of requests for um not real name not at all that i still have to reach out to as well um as far as like people i haven't gotten on or have got on rarely um so this is a, a crowd pleaser so I, no pressure but i'm putting pressure on no <laughs> it's a good thing i picked a good topic a, a topic I'm very excited for. So um, today, uh, actually, you, you're, this is kind of your brainchild. So why don't you go and introduce the concept of this topic? Okay. Yeah, sure. So essentially, like, for the past, like, several months, really, like, I think it started around when Help Wanted 2 came out, specifically. Uh, me and, like, my, like, inner circle of friends have, like, just kind of been, like, musing about the FNAF lore, like, constantly, right? Uh, Mm. And a big thing we've started noticing, like, if we're, like, replaying a game or, like, looking at, like, footage or whatever, is, like, we keep noticing the music and how we keep hearing motifs being reused over and over and in very interesting places. And... It's something that the community has, like, noticed, like, when I've been collecting, like, the, like, tracks for what I've put together here. There's, like, plenty of comments on, like, each video that are like, oh, hey, that's, that's, like, nowhere to run on, like, the FNAF World underneath track. Or, like, oh, there's Watch Your Six uh, in this track, in this track, in this track. Watch Your Six is the first thing I've put here, because that's the easiest Mm -hmm. motif to catch, and I don't think it has like much deep meaning it could but i haven't noticed any specific through line with it it seems to be more like a traditional like fnaf signature almost yeah and that 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 is the tricky one of the trickier bits about doing something like this is like what is a motif for thematic reasons and what is a motif with meaning yeah because some of these are might be stretches i Mm. i am generally kind of insane so, so I might be Look, like the only way to thing. figure out <laughs> the only way to figure out anything in this in the lore and timeline in here is stretch something until it breaks and then look at where it broke. Yeah. Right. So, so there's nothing wrong with shooting a shot, you know? Yeah, I, I've gotten a bit antsy about the FNAF lore, like discussing it with all the glitch mm. trap mimic discourse. It's oof. yeah. <laughs> we'll get to that because it'll lot come of, up. <laughs> a lot of mimic uh, uh, debates, we'll say. Yeah, that's a nice way of putting it. <laughs> yeah. Um, but that aside, uh, I I'm very excited about this because I think it's something mm-hmm. that's tangible enough to where a lot of people will be able to like pick up on it and kind of be like, hmm. I wonder what this means. And I have my own thoughts on what some of this could mean. That's not the definitive answer, full disclosure, obviously, but getting that out of the way, like for sure, how I interpret these is not the be all end all, but I think I have some 
I think I have some ideas that I find compelling. I want to say good mm-hmm. ideas that might be too self-serving, but <laughs> I mean, I, I, I'm excited. So this, this yeah. is like, a, a, you mentioned it's a, a bit of a, 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 a a vacuum, I guess, in the community yeah. a bit. And uh, I I know it's definitely a blind spot of mine. I have really never given it a second thought other than, oh, wow, Vanta Black sounds good. I'm going to put it in the background of my video. <laughs> Vanta Black is so, so good. It's so good. Uh, like, I think that one and then, like, three or four other tracks are just, like, sp- staple go-tos that I go to. Yeah. Um, and that that's really it. I've never sat down and kind of tried to go through this or even picked up on it so t- today is definitely my contributions are going to be a little lesser <laughs> in this conversation <laughs> uh because i feel like this is more so a time for me to sit my ass down and listen because i have not looked into this yeah it's funny because i so just I'm, kind I'm of incredibly stroll excited. up to your dms like hey can, can i can i be yeah. on your podcast because I, I i noticed some things that are really cool and i i think people would like to hear it <laughs> Yeah, and no, then and I find like, out been, I'm highly requested to be on it, and I'm like, oh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, that's I, I'm I, realistically it's because I I do a really bad job of reaching out to people. Oh, <laughs> I just, get I get uh, so nervous about that kind of thing. Like I'll have a spurt where I'm like, I want to reach out to people, and then I do, and then I'm like, okay, I'm I'm done reaching out to people, and then I just kind of hide back in my little cave. <laughs> yeah, it's it's the curse of it's two things for me. It's one. It's ADHD where, like, I have object permanence with people. If I'm not actively talking to someone, I will. I am liable to just forget that they exist. Yes, uh, I'm like that, too. <laughs> that, that's a big problem. And then there's also the introverted extrovert of me where, like, I'm really extroverted with the people I know and interact with. But reaching out to someone I don't know and or just reaching out to someone directly that I do know in general is like, Oh, well then I'll be a burden. And I'm like, Hey, right. This is your job. Figure it out. (laughs) Yeah. I I totally get it. Um, and frankly, I don't think I would have had anything interesting to talk about if you approached me anytime sooner. (laughs) I'm sure we could figure out something as a, (laughs) we could have, but I'm really excited about this in particular. And I think this will be like, the most interesting thing I'll probably have to say for a while. Um, Well, I'm interested in it too. So why don't we kind of dive into this? Yeah. Okay. So first off to kind of give some context uh, for people that don't really like know much about like uh, motifs in like soundtracks, uh, especially in like series or like a condensed thing. Uh, The best example I can give like off the dome is undertale. Uh, Because it is, like, notorious for using leitmotifs everywhere and using them to connect characters and stuff. Like, and Scott Cawthon himself has gone on record saying, like, Toby Fox, the creator of Undertale, is a musical genius. And his favorite track is Death by Glamour, which is nothing but motifs. (laughs) True. So, (laughs) So Death by Glamour has, like, Metaton's, like, first, like, battle theme. It has, like, the core, like... Uh, overworld theme in it. It's got like the cooking show theme. It's got the Napstabluke Mad Dummy uh, and Muffet motif. And mm-hmm. it's just chock full of stuff. And it's a really good example of that. So if anyone listening to this isn't really familiar, I recommend like looking at Undertale stuff to kind of familiarize yourself with how this works and why I'm saying the things I'm going to be saying. <laughs> Because I swear there's a reason. (laughs) Um, Yeah. And and personally, I think Scott may have been very well inspired by Undertale. And I think he works very closely with uh, the lead composer for FNAF, uh, Leon Riskin. Good old Leon. Yeah. I think they work very closely together to make meaningful tracks. And Leon himself, like, has gone on record, like, saying, like, he's had, like, uh, a specific purpose for like why tracks are named the way they are. Um, mm-hmm. Usually they're just kind of like wordplay or, or stuff like that. And yeah. a lot of the tracks I think are very interesting with their names. Like Alchemist Fantasy obviously is a very interesting one because I feel like it has a very obvious connotation of like, Hmm, what is the Alchemist Fantasy in this context? Right. And, 
so that that's the baseline and we'll start out with just like showing the amount of times the watcher six motif shows up uh throughout the series because it has showed up in i think every game except for every game since sister location besides uh pizza sim and help wanted one i'm pretty sure um, that's crazy yeah it, it is just always present so here's the original So that is the original Watcher 6. And the next one... So is that the like the FNAF 1 main menu? <laughs> it is from Ennard's Boss Fight in Sister Location. Ennard's, okay, because it sounded so familiar and I couldn't yeah. like pluck it yeah, out. So okay, the it. first four FNAF games did not have any original soundtracks uh, because Leon Riskin was not uh, brought onto the that. series until FNAF World. I forgot about that, and I immediately remembered all the times I've been copyright claimed for FNAF 2. Yeah. So now I remember that. <laughs> yeah. Which the okay. console ports of the original four FNAF games do have some original tracks. Uh, interesting. But I haven't looked at them, so I don't know if they have anything interesting. Um, yeah. No, I, I didn't even consider that. Yeah. So next up here is Ventablack, which was the music for Sister Location Custom Night. And then right here is one of the tracks from Ultimate Custom Night. I can't remember which one. Uh, it's either Where Dreams Die or Last Breath. And same for that one. Both of those are in UCM. Got it. And then Freddy in Space 2 also has it. Probably in a lot of... <laughs> weird pick. <laughs> so the, the troll games are really weird because they have a boatload of music. And I think they yeah. might be, like, a spot where, like, Scott will, like, dump a lot of, like, test tracks, potentially. Or, I could see like, that. Or, like, tracks that just didn't make it, but yeah. he still liked. Which I think, I think a lot of them could be just originally made for, like, the games themselves. But, like, there's certain ones that are, like, hmm. Like, I think a Cheek in Space has a track in it that's, like, near identical to Gracefully Into the Abyss, except it doesn't have the leitmotifs that it has. Um, oh, I think I remember that one. I, I speed ran Cheek in Space for, like, a month, so I, I've got a couple of the songs Why would you do head. that? It's fun to speed run. It's such a gamble. So the whole thing is, like, three guns are really good. So, as someone who loves the concept of gambling, but would never actually gamble because I'd lose all my money, games that inherently have a bit of RNG in them, I'm in. So, playing the Cheek and Space Speed Run and getting good RNG for all of your guns was such a thrill. So, I understand <laughs> that appeal, but the controls are so bad, I, I could never play it after the first time I played That's it. That's fair. It is. It I think... hurts my hands. <laughs> I think for a time they allowed remapping, but they since I don't think they do anymore. I, I could be speaking out of my ass here, but I, I just remember that I, th that plus shooting did not have a coded cooldown, so you shoot as fast as you can hit the button. And I'm a real good button masher. That's crazy. So, <laughs> so it was just a matter of okay, cool. I got the heart gun. I'm going to melt everything I look at. But yeah, uh, that being anyway. Said, uh, <laughs> I, I don't know what exactly, like, the deal is with the music in the troll games, besides there's a lot of it, and they all use yeah. a lot of motifs. So I think they're very much worth a listen, but I've only included one in this whole, like, track I've put together. So this okay. is the Calder Stone from Freddy in Space 2, which is the Anim Dude's revenge boss fight. So yeah. And uh, next up is Scratch Marks on the Ceiling, which was the music track for the first Security Breach trailer, or like the first like gameplay story Security Breach trailer. Okay. Um, and it also has Watcher 6. Okay. 
I never noticed that. Yeah, it, it like, plays that, that during the uh, the shot where Gregory's like looking at the static monitors, um, okay. in the trailer. And then this one is Tales from the One Eyed Cat Tavern, which is the cowboy the cowboy foxy log ride in Help Wanted Two. And this one is the fun one. Uh, I have it sped up uh, because it's easier to catch the motif. This is from the FNAF movie. And hopefully because it's sped up, it doesn't risk copyright. There's Eh, there's another one later. I think 15 seconds is the cutoff. Okay. So So the other one that'll pop up later probably shouldn't be a risk. uh, Yeah. I mean, worst case scenario, if it gets flagged, you guys don't get to hear it because I'll just cut it out. (laughs) Which... This one specifically is Mike's Dream Sequence 3. And this plays okay. when he wakes up in the Shreddy Faz chair. Okay. Yeah, I don't. If you didn't speed that up, I don't think I would have caught that. Yeah, it, it, it plays very gradually in the actual version of the track. Um, but you can catch it there. And speeding it up, it's like, oh, that's clearly Watcher 6. And I think yeah. that's so cool. And That's really interesting. And the fact that it, like, plays when Mike's, like, about to die, basically, is really cool. Because yeah. that's how it started, was Mike facing off against Afton's machinations. Yeah, that is a good point. Yeah. I think if Watcher 6 has any sort of, like, a thematic through line, it's probably, like, uh, Afton's creation sort of theme like it's, i could see that like his different like creations machinations the, re- the sort result of, of something afton has done yeah um i'm not 100 percent on that because i don't know how the log ride would apply to that unless fair <laughs> but also i'm i haven't paid attention to the log ride itself in a while so it might have some interesting stuff i'm just forgetting about it might i mean the only thing i can think of for the log ride specifically um, because a, a big majority of it is just things that didn't get to make it to the pizza plex. Um, so I, I do wonder if it's, if, if anything, and like, like we mentioned, this is a stretch. If anything, um, I've had a, a theory for a bit that, uh, the reason we don't see a Glamrock Foxy is while his stuff was still being developed, the takeover of the pizza plex began. So they just never got to introduce Foxy and all of this stuff to the Pizza Plex. So if you wanted some kind of a connection there, very loosely, you could argue that all of this stuff never made it to the light of day because of what Afton, or I guess at this point, the iteration of Afton had done. Yeah. Um, Because it is interesting because the log ride is physically present in Ruin. But it yeah. isn't the same as it is in Help Wanted 2. Not even a little bit, no. And it's and like it we see some Foxy, of the cutouts. Obviously. Yeah, like, like we see some of the cutouts are in Ruin as well. Yeah. Like the same exact ones, but they're not in the same place or anything like that. Yeah, it's really interesting. Here's a And fun I would argue <laughs> the log ride we see in Help Wanted 2, no safety concerns at all. So like, <laughs> it's very clearly a different log flume. <laughs> Here, here's here's the next like big one. This is like everywhere, but in a much but it's much more specific where it's used. This is underneath one from FNAF World, and okay, I'm familiar with this one. Yeah, this is a classic. Yeah, this plays when you enter the sub tunnels, uh, in the through the glitched objects. So the motif there will become very obvious if it hasn't already. It okay. plays twice in Pizza Sim. Uh, it might play more. I didn't check every Tycoon music piece, but sure. it I plays mean, in this one at a least. A lot. <laughs> it, it is the baseline for this one. that specific track plays during Duck Pond. I don't know if it plays in any of the other minigames, but it plays in Duck Pond. 
Uh, Interesting. It also has yeah, Toriador I, I... March in it, which Toriador is also like littered everywhere, but I didn't include it in this. Yeah, but uh, since it's not like an original FNAF motif. Sure. Um, and then. That motif is the entirety of Nowhere to Run during Henry's speech. So, Interesting. Okay. So uh, a motif that started in the subtunnels of the flip side um, is now like what I presume to be Henry's motif because it also plays in the tycoon section. And mm. I'll get back to that because I have thoughts on that. But for now... Uh, it also plays in the final Security Breach trailer. Yeah. Interesting. It, it's very specifically correlated to the pizza place, and I also yeah. think it's specifically Henry's motif. Uh, but... Lastly, is Gracefully Into the Abyss, which plays during Princess Quest IV. You know, as I'm a big Gracefully Into the Abyss fan, and I'm a little ashamed <laughs> loving that song and also really liking underground one never once going like wait a minute <laughs> i never put that together and that's why i'm so excited to have this discussion and everyone in the community being able to see it because i i think everyone's going to be really excited to realize how much is here um it's just like a whole other layer that just hasn't been touched yeah and it's like i think everyone in the community loves the fnaf soundtrack i've never seen anyone that oh, doesn't yeah. like it so I think people are going to so be the, uh... really receptive to this because it's like, whoa, no wonder I like it so much. <laughs> <laughs> right. I've seen so many memes of just the uh, the like music compilation of just like different uh, dance gifts and then like hard cut to like someone crying back and forth with the FNAF soundtrack. <laughs> so like, yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah. And speaking of Gracefully Into the Abyss. Let's take a look at Alchemist Fantasy from the Security Puppet minigame, shall we? Sure. I'm even more mad at myself. <laughs> <laughs> Literally, the second you played it, I'm like, shit. Yep. I will admit, I think that's also my own personal blind spot. FNAF 6, probably the game I've played the least. Um, that is completely like, I, fair. It is only I'm fun I'm so half bad the at time. the gameplay. I love the Tycoon. Tycoon's great. The Tycoon's awesome. <laughs> I love oh, that. I, I, I want a knights. standalone FNAF Tycoon. <laughs> um, but because of that, I've never... Um, I've only played... Um, I've only personally played... Midnight Motor is Fruity Maze. I've never g unlocked the security puppet myself. Mm -hmm. So I think I've just had less exposure to that minigame. Yeah. Obviously, I've watched the minigame. Yeah. You know? <laughs> but, but it's one of those things where it's like, if you're not actively thinking about it, it's like, you're going to forget about it. Oh, yeah. For sure. And it's like, there's, I have plenty of blind spots with the series, too. Like, as I know, like, if you, if you point at me and go, all right, what are the two songs in Midnight Motorist and Later That Night? I can, I could, but, 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 but like, I could. Yeah, you could hum it, but you wouldn't know on their the names. spot. But if you, like, gun to my head, what does the song in Security Puppet sound like? I'm dying. It's not <laughs> happening. <laughs> so. But, yeah. And, and I think I'd have an easier time telling you the Ball Pit song, because I've watched that clip too much. <laughs> <laughs> and something interesting about Gracefully Into the Abyss, uh, I should have double checked before we started recording, but there's two versions of it in the Help One and Two soundtrack. There's the 2D version yeah. when you're playing the arcade machine, and the full version when you are you yourself in traveling yeah. through the game. 
And in the 2D version, the nowhere to run motif is not present. In the 3D version, it is. The, there's more I have to talk about with Underneath and Alchemist Fantasy, but we'll get back to that later because that gets into my more speculative stuff. Um, okay. And right now I just want to kind of showcase the music itself. Sure. And obviously I'm saying like my thoughts on it a little bit, but you get it. <laughs> yeah, no, I got you. I got yeah. you. Anyway, so this one I don't think has any like particular like deep meaning because it's only showed up twice in the series to my knowledge, but it's cool. Sure. So it's the boss theme from FNAF World. And then it was also used in the final Security Breach trailer. Once again, FNAF World lovers on top. <laughs> I have been religiously playing like FNAF World Randomizer for months i got i gotta try it out it's so fun it's so fun because it is pure torture and especially with how you described why you like playing cheek in space you would adore it yeah. you would adore it i was gonna say like as someone who loves good rng you know it's funny i <laughs> i recently um brief i guess a uh, quick shout out i recently watched uh storm Mister's video on which fnaf games are canon and stuff and there's a bit at the end talking about like the possibility that the only canon Scott Cawthon game is FNAF World. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I want to live in a I want to live in a universe where the correct take is the only canon game is FNAF World and the only canon book is the security log book. <laughs> that'd, be, that'd be so funny. Not, it's such a wild even take, but it's like the security logbook, the the security breach guidebook, because everyone hates. Oh that no, thing. <laughs> not that one. Defeat after the mission. I meant the activity book. <laughs> I love that the updated version came out, and it's the exact same with just a couple extra pages now. So I, all the mistakes I, are still there. I love that, and and I also think it's really funny too. Like people people see like defeat Afton and the sending is yours. I'm like burn trap is. Uh, this withered spring body animatronic merged with FNAF antagonist William Afton, and they and they look at that and that go, that is a similar uh, oversight to a misquote from Cheek. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's like I I think if Scott cared about anything in that thing, it would be the identity of the main antagonist of the game. <laughs> right. Like there's there's the different. It's like with the character encyclo encyclopedia where like there are issues where it's a. Uh, uh, hi, hi, a withered foxy's hook hand has gone astray, and in FNAF three, his hook hand has gone astray. Like stuff <laughs> like that, which is like funny, silly bits. And then there will be like a hot take for two whole paragraphs, and someone will like, yeah, these are the same caliber of mistake. It's like, um, well, <laughs> yeah. It, it's even funnier when people I've seen people that are like, see the security guide, security breach guidebook still isn't reliable because it still says burn trap is after, and it's like. I don't think that's the metric to judge it on. I, right? I think that's the wrong metric to judge if it's reliable or not, because that's making a bold claim about a what's currently a mystery in the fandom. <laughs> yep. Uh, which, speaking of Afton, get, getting off that sure. before people get mad at me. Uh, <laughs> let, it's let's, too late. Let's... Here, I'll take the heat off you. Hey, guys, you remember when you all said Kelly was canon? <laughs> I remember. <laughs> Pepperidge Farm remembers. The wiki was changed for a month. Kelly Burntrap is the funniest thing because <laughs> it because he the mimic got into the suit at the end of that book. Everyone said, "See, yep. it's the Burntrap flesh." And the very beginning of the next epilogue, he <laughs> First shakes her paragraph. off. He shakes like, her like, off like a like a frame one <laughs> off. The mimic's like, "Nope, none of that." <laughs> Oh, that was very good. It's even funnier looking at Burntrap's actual model because that is mm -hmm. the most inhuman monster I've ever seen. And it's really yeah. funny when people try to say, see, that's a teenager. 
<laughs> like they or tried like, to do see, it for Kelly. See, it's they any kind it of regular Luca. person. It's like you compare it to Vanessa, a fully grown adult, and she is like microscopic compared to his face. <laughs> yeah, like it's like any normal human remains do not make sense on this model. Yeah, it's <laughs> like, like you compare him to like Scrap Trap, which even though Scrap Trap's face is very not natural, it's still like right. more closely human than Burn Trap yeah. is. And I think that's very intentional, especially since mm-hmm. we know what like a FNAF human looks like now in the current art style. Yeah, we finally have good looking FNAF humans. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it took a bit, but we got it. <laughs> and it's no like, more peanuts. No more <laughs> peanuts. Oh, uh, but. <laughs> but speaking of Afton. But speaking of Afton and making fun of his stupid peanut head. Um, True. I love that his big forehead is canon too. Like Jimmy Neutron looking ass. Like, <laughs> his big forehead is consistent cuz Matthew Lillard has a pretty big forehead too. Like True. Like and now people can finally say canonically William Afton is hot. Uh, uh Matthew Lillard played him. There you yep. go. <laughs> Pe- people were trying to say he was hot when the only design we had was the Pinky Pills version. Get out of here. <laughs> God. No. I'm so grateful I don't for like Matthew Twink Lillard. Afton. <laughs> I hate Twink Matthew Afton. Lillard giving us a good version. Afton is like a 50-year-old man in his prime, and right? that is when he's the most appealing. Also, weirdly buff. Like, just to consider how nimble he is in that costume, he has to be stacked under there. <laughs> I think the suit augments him. I think he's actually I pretty doubt physically it. weak. Uh, I could see that. And that would also kind of play into his insecurities not being within the suit yeah especially with like how we know how he was in the charlie trilogy where like yes during the fred bears era like when he and henry were actually working together afton was like really fat and like healthy and just a really sociable guy and stuff like he was still screwed up in the head probably but like sure. before anything went wrong he was he was doing pretty good for himself he was like a normal looking guy yeah <laughs> and like then when they actually meet him as Dave Miller, he's just this like malnourished, gaunt, like repulsive looking like security guard. And it's he's like, like that. I think Roald Dahl did it. I'm not sure who, but it's like that one children's author drawing where it was like your nature inside will affect how you look outside. Yeah. It was like if you have ugly thoughts, you'll have an ugly face. But if you have happy thoughts but instead of like the person getting uh, like progressively uglier it's just someone's head turning more and more into a peanut <laughs> <laughs> and and speaking of scrap trap uh <laughs> yeah i i also think it's very interesting seeing the progression of the spring trap designs because each one gets progressively like thinner and ganglier like yeah the original spring trap is like chunky and fat right Mm-hmm. And then Scrap Trap is way scrawnier and, like, more gangly. And then you get to Burn and Trap, then... and it's, like, he's a skeleton, essentially. And, like, yeah, he has I'm, giant I'm waiting for, like, three and, like... more games, and it's just going to be the, I hated chocolate, but it's Afton. <laughs> like... And then you have Ruin Born Afton. Never mind. Uh, True! <laughs> I th- Funniest thing about that video, that the whole bit started, because we were looking yeah. at the at the the unused model for the entity and it looks like a full progression like from burn trap into like an afton spirit essentially interesting um but you know it went unused so it's not like you can really yeah, talk it went about unused, it that much it, but and I, I think it's really I'm interesting still of the camp into yeah. the development of the entity as a character um but I, i'm still of the opinion that the entity did nothing wrong I I am fully of the opinion that its programming was somebody is doing something they shouldn't. I should alert a nearby robot to remove them from the premises. It ain't his fault. Every nearby robot will murder on site. I it think, didn't know. I think you are <laughs> covering for a murderer. <laughs> and maybe I am. Like, but he's my tune summon skull and I love him. I love him too. <laughs> but that guy has has a uh, hypothetical blood on his hands. Canonically, he uh, doesn't not, kill Cassie. Not in the but canon. He tried I was going to say, not canonically. <laughs> Hypothetically, canonically, speaking, he doesn't. <laughs> but, like, uh, 
like uh there there's a specific part in ruin where he pops up um yep. and help will like pop up with a little alert and he's like warning unknown entity has hijacked security protocols and then later it's like you find out Mexus is the security system and it's like so what exactly was the entity hijacking i would argue i would counter that helpy is deliberately lying because if anyone is hijacking a security protocol i would argue it's whoever this quote-unquote helpy in our mask is i think that's fair um pretty pretty convenient for the person who's uh, for the program trying to disable the security system to pretend to be the security system and call the security system <laughs> a virus we better that, route this virus out of the secure this virus out of our security system that is Wink. a good argument but blue eyed helpy says that not orange eye helpy and i think that throws a That's very fair. interesting wrench into the mix and i th- i that don't trust blue eye helpy either but i yeah. think he might be kind of like playing both sides in a way cuz i think he and the entity fair. are both linked in a way um which I could see that 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 gets into more speculative territory that I yeah I do mean not have... to be fair pretty much anything we can say about ruin besides Cassie's dad is probably help wanted too yeah anything else anything is else very is too much. speculative and people don't like what I have to say about the entity and I don't really know <laughs> what exactly I think about the entity I after help wanted I don't too. know what the consensus on the entity is to be honest uh I really don't know the consensus after I, help I would, wanted too I have no idea because everyone was like. Oh, it's a security system and just kind of left it there. But I think Help yeah. Wanted 2 throws a very interesting wrench into the mix, especially with like the whole help trap thing. Because that's yeah. like, we don't know what help trap is really. Like it could be Mass really it could be Helpy, it could be the entity, it could be all three if it wanted to be. Like we don't know. And yeah, especially with the idea of um, B72 introducing when a um, different version of someone is cut off they don't necessarily dissolve they just move on to something else yeah because i saw someone attach that on twitter with the idea of vanny of like vanessa and vanny when if if in the universe where princess quest 3 works and vanny is taken out of vanessa vanny doesn't dissolve she's put into something else yeah i i think I like the that same idea. applies to william too i think i think yeah. william the human and the monster spring trap are kind of two separate entities that are like obviously intertwined because it's the same guy but yeah at some point and i think it's after fnaf 6 the the dominant force is the spring trap rather than i think there's good the argumentation man. for that um, especially considering we at least have loose evidence that heat and fire can reduce the effectiveness or if william is correct get rid of remnant mm-hmm. but i don't uh, i correct me if i'm wrong i have only read like half of the fazbear frights i'm getting there um but as far as agony goes we don't know what gets rid of that yeah i don't know so i haven't read all it, the frights or tales either I, I don't know so i i as far as i'm aware we know very little about what can actually deal with agony so yeah. if the fnaf 6 fire did successfully burn away most of the remnant that was in those animatronics there's something else that was there too. And and I see people always be like, Afton was stopped by falling into the lake. And it's like, I don't think that's enough to stop that. <laughs> right? Like we we've seen a, him go through a lot worse. <laughs> like garbage crumbling into a lake, I think is more of an inconvenience for him than a be all end all. Especially when the I- puppet mask that was tossed at him is under the under the raceway of the pizza plex, it's in the tangle. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, hmm, something tells me that rubble ain't in the lake no more. <laughs> uh, all that said, but, but, people are yeah, going to hate said, me because uh, we keep getting sidetracked and I haven't played look, this yet. <laughs> that's the, the it's the state of modern FNAF. You have to say whatever you do say and then don't look at Twitter for 2 weeks until people forget. Oh, I actually wasn't talking about that. <laughs> I said they were going to hate me because we still haven't played Ooh, this. Okay. <laughs> What's this? I said that I was going to play this like 15 minutes ago or something. <laughs> now, before you play that, we should discuss <laughs> Okay. Anyway. Uh so 
Here's a, this is sped up isoptrophobia from Ultimate Custom Night. This is the menu okay. theme uh, that plays at the character select. And most of the song is that melody, like, looping over and over and over. Sure. Um, and, and the notes point. themselves vary. Uh, I was going to say, interesting stanzas. point to that. I, I take back my previous statement. FNAF 6, I've played second least. Ultimate Custom Night, I have barely touched. Because How do you I play like... that game? I, I still exactly. don't understand. Because you can like, I, only I, look at the instruction card when you boot up the game. And then yep. after that, it's like, you're on your own. You're on your own. And then it's also a matter of, like, I like a game that has a progression. And I understand the idea of, like, oh, you control the progression. That's too much control for me. If I if I want a sandbox game, I'm not going to play a FNAF game. And also, so I've never I just enjoyed don't like that playing game Ultimate Custom Night because uh, the classic FNAF <laughs> gameplay. Uh, I think it has a lot of really unique charm to it, and I like revisiting them. But yep. a game that is entirely that, where all of the power is put in your hands, I just kind of go, I don't have to do this. My my big thing with FNAF has always been like the gameplay is so so. I like the lore, I like the horror. I would argue UCN has interesting lore, but the 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 main point of it is the gameplay, and that's my least favorite part about FNAF. Like, I, yeah. <laughs> I, and not to mention the horror. Ultimate Custom Night, because of the limitations of Click Team, has the worst jump scares in the franchise, by far. Yeah, yeah. I, I would argue best jump scares in the franchise. FNAF AR. But you know, pour one out. Pour um, one out. For regardless, that one. <laughs> what I was gonna say, having barely played Ultimate Custom Night, I recognize that melody. Yeah, that motif, as if you will. And Isoptrophobia is a really interesting name for a track like this because it is like the fear of mirrors or the fear of your reflection. One of the two means the same interesting. thing, really. And the whole yeah. thing is like William facing off against his creations and his past. And I, I think yeah. that lends a very interesting piece of insight into him as a person. I think he hates reflecting on himself. And I would agree. Yeah, that, that would make a lot of sense with the character, with what little characterization we have of him. Yeah, especially when like uh, Springtrap and Scraptrap are both present and both attack you. I think that is yeah. a very telling, like even there, like in the mix. And there are character omissions in Ultimate Custom Night. So if there was like any point of like they shouldn't be there because they are William I think they would have been omitted but I think it's important that they're there yeah and it's also a matter of like the idea of um what we see at the end of the FNAF movie with like you wretched little beasts mm -hmm. he says wearing an animatronic costume you know like I, I think that is on purpose like it's yeah. it's not it, it's it's projection yeah and like William is so interesting because, like, he he constantly, like, will try and get control. He wants to have control. And as soon as he loses it, he, like, goes into a panic and can't think. And will usually, like, yeah. just regress to, like, like, yelling and insulting, like, whoever he's talking mm -hmm. to. Like, we see it in the movie. Like, as soon as he loses control of the animatronics, he starts, like, uh, he starts screaming, like... Look yeah, it's you. not it's not run, it's not I need to get that picture. It's yeah. I'm just going to scream at you. Look at the nasty things that you've become. And yeah. <laughs> and the same thing happens in the security breach trailer like when Glitchtrap is presumably like speaking to Vanessa, he's like, "You will do as I say." And like yeah. he he has that whole tantrum and it happens again in the movie. And Who do you think both of you are? I, I since think... you brought it up, I'm going to put you on the spot cuz I have an opinion on this. Who do you think you will, both of you, burn. Who I you think, think the to? most plausible answer with the information we have is probably Vanessa and Gregory. Um, I agree. Because especially I think with that was Gigi an earlier draft mind, of the game. It's like, yeah. I think both of them, like, at least at one point, were working together under Glitchtrap and trying to fight him, essentially, uh, without yeah. his knowledge. And then it turned into more of a streamlined... Vanessa is secretly working for Glitchtrap and Gregory's trying to escape and can't remember why he's there or what he was doing I, before. I agree. My, my pet theory on that, I think an earlier draft of the game 
would have been closer to kind of what we see in Help Wanted 2, where we're still playing as Gregory, but we're doing something that seems innocuous. And at some point in the game, we break out of GGY and we become Gregory. And yeah. then the rest of Security Breach kind of happens. And I think they made the correct choice in this is way too much for our first game. This, this would be a hard sell. Let's wait and do something like this later. Yeah, um, I think Security Breach especially was like significant growing pains. Uh, yeah. Which like this this was like the first like pseudo triple a fnaf game even though steel wolves indie everyone was kind of looking at this like the big like the big kahuna yep. i mean i think the the wikipedia is literally fnaf like fazbear triple a or something like that for all of the steel wool games that's where crazy. it's like this is still an in it's still an indie developer guys this is an independent team yeah but the the wiki i believe the url is like triple a fazbear or something like that yeah and it's like uh and, and i think there was a lot of pressure on both them and scott and yeah. at that point, Scott had only worked with them on one game and Help Wanted One's pretty small. So it's like, yeah. I think there was a lot of communication issues at the time. I think just figuring out what they wanted the game to be, what they wanted the story to be. And like, uh, not to mention working with Sony, they probably had like a very strict yeah. like, holiday 2021 deadline. I think working with Sony and then yeah. the scope of it in general. Yeah, too. just the like, big I think scope of Steel Wool has proved they are really strong at smaller scope things, yeah. with, especially with Ruin. And I think if they tried their hand at like a large scope thing again, it'd go a lot better than Security Breach did. Yeah, because I think they're I in a really good groove now with the series. Like they've worked mm -hmm. on it for several games now, and they've really hit their stride. And I think the community's taken notice. Um, yeah, I, I agree. I think the past two games they put out, uh, if you count Ruin as standalone, I do. I think between Ruin and Help Wanted Two, that that that's a great streak to be on. Yeah, and I, if they devote their time to my prayers, they've mentioned they want to do a Fred Bear's game. <laughs> I think a Steel Wool led Fred Bear's game where it's just Fred Bear's would be incredibly strong. I think, I think if they do like a prequel game like Fred Bear's, I think they might even shoot for earlier in the timeline than that. I think I would love a fall fest game. I think, yeah. to. I think I, I would love a fall fest game. Yeah. I think we might actually get to see like the very beginning of the timeline. Cause that's like, I think everyone is at the point where it's like, we still don't know like yep. the starting of this and even taking like silver eyes into account. It's like, that's still very little information and not everything in that is consistent with the games. It's just, yep. we know the and, character and dynamic of the Henry and like, Liam, <laughs> and we don't even get to see them have a conversation ever. <laughs> yep. It's like that. And like the fact that the earliest game in the timeline happens about halfway through the timeline. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, okay, we have FNAF four, which we see the bite of 83, which is, Already after Freddy Fazbear's is an established brand, it's like you got yep. Fred Bear and Spring Bonnie, but you also have Freddy Bonnie Chica Foxy, which yeah like, with Fazbear and friends. Yeah, and it's like now that we're seeing like 1970 as an important year, I think it's like we're finally maybe going to look back into that era to finally. Fill I in can that only blank. hope so. I really want that because I really like William and Henry as characters, and it pains me how little we like see of them. Like, we get plenty of, like, William as Springtrap, but even then, that's, like, kind of more just, like, he pops in at the end, like, rah, I'm Springtrap. <laughs> exactly. And then there's the, then there is also the fear with a game that early in the timeline of, like, some a, a wrench we didn't expect. Because I think there's a lot of expectations with something that would happen yeah. that early. And, I, and a fair ones, too, that, like... Absolutely. This will probably be here. This will probably be here. And then there's the fear of, like... Ah, yes. Did you get the secret ending of Fall Fest when Henry shows up to work and uh, Charlie's like on his side and he goes, where's your brother? And Sammy runs up like there's that fear. Imagine, <laughs> imagine if Sammy pulled up to the function. Um, if Sammy rolls up to Fall Fest, everything is getting rewritten. We got to we got to take our whiteboards and erase them. Like, yeah. and, and I think like especially like with how I with how I understand like Scott like working i yeah. think he's very like afraid to kind of put himself all the way out there in terms of his writing 
I think that's a big reason yeah, the movie took so long and why it took him like a very long time to go, wait, I should make this just an adaptation of FNAF 1, like featuring Mike as the main character. Right. I think he gets very antsy about like really putting the story at the forefront because he seems to be very like concerned about like what people think about it. But I agree. No, he definitely seems very like almost self-conscious. Yeah. I, I think he's very self-conscious about it and reasonably so given this community, <laughs> but uh, the, the community and the size of what admittedly started as one guy, you know, yeah, it's like he, like he started FNAF one as a last ditch effort to make games. And then he's like, Oh, I'm making something now. Okay. And I think by FNAF four, he's like, I need to get my act together and like, make sure I have like a cohesive story that people yep. actually are interested in and that I want to tell. Um, Cause the first four feel very flying by the seat of his pants. But then like, as I soon as agree, we yeah. get to sister location, it's like, Oh, there's Afton's name drop. Here's like Elizabeth and Michael. And like, we're kind of establishing well, let's flesh this out a little bit. Yeah. Um, cause like beforehand it was just like, we have the purple guy. He shows up for a couple mini games. If you die a lot. <laughs> yeah. And, and big twist. He's spring trap. Don't know what his name is though. <laughs> yeah. We'll figure that out. Later. We'll figure that it's out. Later. But yeah, I, I think, I think with that, I think with how Scott writes the story and like how he's been very like a slow trickle with information. I think he wants to eventually cover that part of the timeline, but I think that mm -hmm. might be the closest piece of it to his heart potentially, because I think I would agree. Henry and William are both very, very like close characters to him because they are by all intents and purposes, extensions of him. Yeah. Um, I, I, yeah. Especially Henry. Like, I, I, I think it's a case of like, he wants to wait until the perfect time to do something like that. And a game like that needs to have good writing because it can't rely on horror because nothing has happened in that point in the timeline. <laughs> Yep, like it can be kind of spooky at times, but it's, it's something in Fall Fest, like what would the horror be at that point? Yeah, because um, William um, wouldn't have killed anyone yet, to our knowledge. Uh, to our knowledge, and the wrench. And it's like, <laughs> I think we'd want to see how he and Henry interact when everything is going okay. Yeah. Because we only know what happens after things went wrong. Um, right, all right, so... So that all being said, yeah, where does this motif go? Yeah, let's get back to the music. I'm going to I'm just going to replay it. And yeah, replay that. Give us a refresher. Yeah. So isoptrophobia menu for ultimate cosplay. Okay. And then right here is where dreams die, which is one of the tracks that plays in ultimate custom night. It's that like kind of four note rise with like the second one varying yeah. pretty, pretty often. And what, and what I find really interesting about this is the next thing. The yellow what rabbit's from? theme from the movie seems to be the same motif from isoptrophobia. Interesting. So I'll, I'll play those two back to back really quick. Yeah. No, because I hear it. Yeah. And I had to re-listen to it a few times to be sure I was hearing it right. Um, Because it's like, is it really? No, I do hear that. I think that's so cool. And it's like, I always thought it was like interesting that they decided to make Afton's theme like sound like that. Because he's never yeah. really had a dedicated theme for himself up to the point of the movie. Like there have been music tracks like associated with him, but it's never been a consistent. He's like, never thing. had like the stinger of yeah. him. And then... The Yellow Rabbit, like, has that four-note, like, bursting, like, 
one, two, three, four. And yeah. it just repeats and repeats and repeats. Um, like it plays a few times and then it does like some like horror stinger, like music stuff. I really love the track, the yellow rabbit. It's really good. The movie in general has really good music. Um, I do remember that. I, I saw it. I saw it. Obviously, we all watched it in theaters. And then once it came out on Peacock, a.k.a. the same day, <laughs> we went home and watched it a couple more times. Um, <laughs> I I remember <laughs> on the, the, the one watch through when I was doing the Easter egg video, um, this was now the fourth time I had watched it fully where I, I like stopped listening to the dialogue and I was just like looking at the screen for visuals and listening to the music at that point. I was like, oh, that's pretty good. Yeah. It, it's so funny. Like as soon as uh, I actually flew out uh, to my friend Amber's house uh, for the movie premiere, mm. uh, me and uh, me, her and our friend uh, Emily, we all, we all went there to watch the movie together. And then like the rest of that week, I think we watched it like 10 times <laughs> at home. Yeah. Right. And it was, I made sure to get it on DVD before they took it off Peacock, which I think they already did, which yeah. is crazy. It, it's on Cause Amazon there are Prime still now, profile pictures. Sure. You still get the FNAF profile pictures for Peacock. <laughs> so I'm like, why do you have these, but not the movie they're from? That's, That's really crazy. Funny. The FNAF movie decided it was too good for Peacock. <laughs> Apparently. Um, but yeah, next up is, uh, Pinwheel Circus and Pinwheel Funhouse from FNAF World, because these sure. show up a few times in really interesting ways. Um, but yeah. kind of hear the the general melody in both of them yeah the like melody with a little bit of the like circus like uh syncopation of it and then we have huh and then in the security breach uh the first trailer we get So in that trailer, that section was just straight up crumbling dreams. And I think, yeah, th and I, I hear agree. pinwheels motif in crumbling dreams. And then Doomsday Ride from Help Wanted 2, which plays in the carousel level. Uh, oh, speaking of carousel level, great <laughs> track on that one. Yeah. Like I remember when I was playing it and you're like in the survival part of like the second half where you just survive for two minutes. I was like, this track is distractingly good. <laughs> it's so good and i i still feel really proud of myself because uh when i went to pax uh to play help wanted two um I, I i played the carousel level and uh one of the steel wool employees that was like working at the booth um like uh they said to me after i beat the level they were like oh yeah you're you're one of the you're one of the few people to have actually beaten that one and i felt so proud of myself really? Oh, good shit. <laughs> I I never felt so proud of myself for beating a FNAF level ever. And I don't think and you I'm, know what? I don't think I'm ever going to reach that high again. <laughs> Speaking of help one at two levels, Steel Wool, if you're watching this because you're like, oh, I wonder what the fans think of the, the music and stuff. Steel Wool, please. Endless mode for food prep. It can't be that hard. Please. <laughs> I will pay... Upwards of sixty dollars, just added endless mode. Anyway, um. <laughs> anyway, Doomsday Ride from Help Wanted Two. So it's just straight up pinwheel. Yeah, that's straight up pinwheel. It's like a blend almost, because like yeah. pinwheel and crumbling are like very very similar if not the same mm -hmm. and it feels like 
the Karis, uh, the, the Help on a Two track is almost like taking those two incredibly similar themes, if not the same, and just bam, new version. Yeah. Yeah, it feels like a perfect, like a perfect storm of the two. Um, yeah. And I think it might even be the same instrument here as it is in Scratch Marks on the Ceiling, which is neat. I could, I could see that. So this one that I'm about to do might be a stretch because I don't always hear it when I listen to it. Some of my friends do, and I have heard it, like, listening to it before, but I'm not I'll, I'll focus in. I'm not confident I'm locking about in. it. So anyone watching that's more musically inclined than I am might have an easier time picking up on if this is right or not than I can, but Sister Location Elevator theme. A classic. All right, get ready. Run it back, run it back. Just run it back right away. I see what you're saying. I see what you're saying. We're like, it's very close. I also don't know. <laughs> yeah, I, I can't tell. So hopefully that is distractingly close. Hopefully someone like has a better ear for like musical intricacies than either of us do, because I'm really curious about this one. And there is a connection with that elevator in the daycare attendant because of Help Wanted 2. Yeah, so I, it's yeah, like, exactly. Help Wanted 2. Not to mention uh, the idea, which very, very speculative. But I have a feeling that some of the circus themed animatronics originated at a fall fest. And if that is true, that kind of leans on the carousel and the daycare attendant yeah. and all of that ideas. Yeah, there's something up with that. There's something there's there. There's something up with that guy. <laughs> anyway. So here we have Venta Black from Sister Location. And then the unused track from Security Breach, Snap Goes the Spinal Cord. And then here's the crazy one. That's, that's in, what? <laughs> Everyone I've played this to has had that exact reaction, like just, what? <laughs> I would have never in a million years been like, oh, this kind of sounds like, but no, that's just the same notes, I, just happier. I, I don't That's even crazy. remember how I thought to check Forgotten Sunday show for that. I don't know why I was listening to it, but I caught it and I'm like, what? That's in, that's, <laughs> what do you mean? What do you, it's the, it's the goddamn Jennifer Lawrence on the hot ones. Just, what do you, what do you mean? What do you mean? <laughs> Which, uh, this one, Snap Goes the Spinal Cord, I find very yeah. interesting. Uh, because it went unused, but we've been getting unused tracks like brought back either like in security breach patches or in Help mm -hmm. Wanted 2. Like uh, sure. Scrapyard Megalodon was unused when the game launched, but then they added it into the Monty Chase at the beginning of the game. Yeah. And then uh, Fantaguzia, Fantaguzia, I don't know how to say it, but that ended up being used in Help Wanted 2 for the FNAF 2 Fazer Blast level. Um, okay. And I find it really interesting that this one specifically has not been used yet. Because this is the one that I think was supposed to be for the final boss of the game. 
but didn't get used. And uh, the name of the track, Leon Riskin has actually like talked about it. it. It's supposed to be a play on "Snap Goes the Spinal," "Snap Goes the Spinal Cord," and uh, "Final Cord." So. Oh, okay. I hear that. So it's kind of a double meaning where it's like the spine sure. snaps, and then it's the final chord, like the finale, basically. So I think this was supposed to be the burn trap boss fa- fight uh, theme. And that would make sense, too, with how skeletal Burn Trap yeah. is. Yeah, and the fact that it, like, is Venta Black, like, it's just straight up a full Venta Black remix. And Venta yeah. Black is from Sister Location. It's like, hmm, that hmm. seems like an Afton theme. <laughs> yeah. And I imagine the reason it's gone unused is because the Burn Trap ending ended up not being the canon ending, and then Burn Trap has not showed up since. Yeah. Not to mention, if it is, like, kind of an Afton theme, that upbeat version of it makes sense, right? Yeah. That's his, like, incognito mode when he's, you know... Yeah, because it's, like... A, a good a, a good person, quote-unquote. Yeah, because Forgotten Sunday show is, like, very, like, slimy corporate Fazbear Entertainment, very tug-and-cheek yep. hand unit It's humor. his Steve Raglan, yeah, you know? Yeah, it's his and Steve Raglan hand unit enough. kind of, like, way of, like, presenting information and stuff. And, like, even though the tutorial unit in pizza sim like conveys information on Henry's behalf. It feels very Afton still, um, which is really, really interesting. Yeah. Um, and so like that linked with Venta black linked with spinal cord. It's like, this seems the most like an Afton motif that we could have in the games. I think with the movie out, the isoptrophobia motif is probably what we'll see more of going forward. But I think... I think that does make sense. I think up to the point that these uh, songs came out, this was the closest we had. Um, And with How Help wanted to kind of, like, teased Burn Trap again, like, right at the end, and Ruin teased it too, I think they're right. saving him, and that's why they haven't used this in, like, just any level. Because I think sure. this could have easily been used in, like, the Ennard... And like Circus Baby, uh, Ballora, Funtime Freddy levels. Uh, For sure. In Help Wanted 2. Like, that would have been perfect. But they specifically didn't use it. There's no music there. Um, so this is like still like on the table to be used in a future game. And I think it's got a specific purpose they're saving it for. Um, which next up is Sleep No More from Ultimate Custom Night. A classic. And then Fantagusia from uh, Help Wanted 2. Yeah. Huh. Uh, which Fantagusia is also like just an explicitly like full remix. Uh, or at least I assume it is because back when Security Reach came out and like the sound files were like dumped. Everyone yeah. called uh, Spinal Cord and Sleep and Fantagusia just Venta Black and Sleep No More. Yeah. Probably because it's just that obvious, but... Because that's what I... For... Uh, I have... It's funny. Um, Snap Goes the Spinal Cord is the version of... I guess the quote-unquote version of that song that I use in videos. And I straight up thought it was Vanta Black because that's what it was listed as on YouTube. Yeah. So, <laughs> in my files, it is listed as Vanta Black. Yeah, something That's interesting really about Spinal Cord is it does not have the Watcher Six motif. Venta Black does. Interesting. And I think that's very interesting. Or maybe it's hidden in there. Yeah. And I just didn't catch it, but eh. it doesn't have it as blatantly as Venta Black does. Sure. And then. The last one on just the listen and kind of let it be track sure. is Don't Open the Door, which is the Halloween hub theme from FNAF World Update 2. 
Right. Also on the internet known as uh, Postra Sandra. <laughs> <laughs> And then Scorched Cranberry Special from Help Wanted 2. Probably the best one in the game, to be real. Huh. It's the exact same. That's so interesting. Yeah. <laughs> it's just huh. straight up the that, same that's track. It's the same song, just in a different vibe. Yeah. <laughs> and interesting and this morning when i was like doing last minute preparations uh for this uh i looked I up don't... caught in a loop from princess quest uh one two and three yes the like original princess quest one and the comments on the video uh mentioned that it had the motif from fnaf world like the one i just played yeah i can't quite hear it but i tried to so let me see if you can hear it because evidently other I'm people did, in. but I'm having I'm trouble in. catching it. It's close. It's right? close. It's not because I, 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 I hear the scorched cranberry special. No, no, I wouldn't say so. I hear like the first like the first four count kind of match, but then it kind of goes somewhere else where yeah. the FNAF World Two doesn't. Yeah. So, so it's tricky, but I think it's there. Uh, I'm going like, to trust the YouTube it. comments. <laughs> I hear it. Maybe I'm missing something, too. To me, it sounds it sounds close, but I wouldn't just say that is the same motif. Yeah. Which, if it is the same motif, I find it really interesting because that means this motif appears in Update 2 of FNAF World, Help Wanted 1 through Princess Quest on the mobile port, and Help Wanted 2 for the credits. And also, by proxy, the end of Princess Quest Four. Um, yeah. And interesting. And now I can get into my uh, crazy conspiracies. All right, let's go down. Now we go down the rabbit hole. Update two is really interesting with the character selection it has on the roster. Which okay. um, let me actually grab. Yeah, let me a pull up a screenshot of the roster because I actually took one recently. So I have it in my hand. Here you go. So bottom row on the FNAF World oh, character perfect. select is the Halloween edition characters. So they have Jacko Bonnie, Jacko Chica, Anim Dude, Chipper, Nightmare BB, Nightmarian, Coffee, and Purple Guy. Right. And each of these characters in some way appear in Help Wanted. Jacko Bonnie and Jacko Chica and... Nightmare BB and Nightmarian are all very obvious. Like, they just... Yeah, those appear. ones... Yeah, sure. Coffee has a cameo appearance in it. He's a very rare Easter egg, but he actually does show up in the game. Like... Interesting. They, they made an entire, like, new coffee model for Help 101 huh. just for that Easter egg. And then Chipper has, like, the L-chip, like, uh, tortilla chip bag... That's yeah. about as much as he gets, but I think it's Which, I mean, counts. it's something. Um, and then for Anim Dude, he's like Scott. But he's Scott, but not Scott. And sure. And indie. by that definition, we have the rogue indie dev in Help Wanted 1. Yeah. That is Scott, but not Scott. <laughs> yeah. And lastly is Purple Guy. And I think, and I think that's a very interesting case. Because like... Immediate assumptions like, oh, it's William Afton. But this purple guy is like one of the few that's not William. He's just a game sprite. Like he he outright says so in FNAF World. He's like, oh, I'm not the real purple guy. I'm just a game sprite. Sure. And in Help Wanted 1, we have a spring trap, like in the FNAF 3 minigames, where he's clearly Fair. not possessed by William, like in the, in the game. Like that's... That is just yeah, the like character that, that spring is the trap. programmed character spring trap. And he also has his corpse head is recolored to be purple, like very, very starkly purple. Yeah. And I think that's a really interesting kind of like connection. It is a little flimsier 
than the other like obvious ones. But Fair. but I think it is an intentional choice. Um especially with how weird it is to kind of just almost arbitrarily change Springtrap's corpse head to be purple. Cause that wasn't like a thing they did with like Burn Trap or anything. Like it was just for help wanted. Yeah. Um and it's like we have all the Halloween edition characters from FNAF 4, except for Nightmare Mangle, and then Coffee, uh, Chipper L. Chip, Anim Dude, Rogue Indie Dev, and a representative of Afton. Interesting. And FNAF World Update 2 and Help Wanted both just completely omit Nightmare Mangle, but have all the other Halloween characters. Ultimate Custom Night, weirdly, has Nightmare Mangle. So I feel like that might have been kind of an intentional thing or it might have just... Yeah, it might just be just coincidence or something. Yeah, it could very well just be coincidence. It's hard to tell, but I find it interesting. And with this musical connection, it makes me much more prone to think it is intentional. Because right. why else would they use this motif for Help Wanted 2? And right. And potentially Help Wanted 1. Because the help and and you bring up a good point with the FNAF World Update Two cast. Because if I look at oh yeah Halloween Update roster, I the fact that they would include and I understand Easter eggs. I totally get Easter eggs, mm -hmm. but these specific characters over something like I don't know the like any other of the um like including any of them over someone who was from the FNAF Four Halloween Update, yep. right? That is an interesting choice. And Coffee especially is really, really odd. Because Scott Coffin lost the model for Coffee, like, while he was working on FNAF World. Like, like he yeah. lost all his old files besides the FNAF stuff. So, like, when, when he was making Update 2, he just had to recycle uh, the 2D animations that he used for Coffee in The Desolate Hope because he didn't have the model anymore. But Steel Wool completely remodeled the guy just for a couple little cameos. Yeah. And then Nightmarian specifically is like obviously shown up over and over and over again. Yeah, Nightmarian is a it's whole like, thing. He, he's a whole <laughs> thing. And I think it's interesting. And I think also, not to mention Update 2 in FNAF World, like all the characters are like, oh, you can't use me yet because my code was recycled for... Uh, some crappy video games and stuff. And then Help Wanted, the whole plot is like the animatronics code was repurposed for this video game. That, you know, I never actually thought of it that way, but that is a very good point that they are very kind of similar in that way. Yeah. And, and FNAF World in general, like, keeps being relevant in ways you wouldn't think it to be. And, and I think it serves as a really interesting kind of blueprint for how FNAF's universe works without it directly being involved in the main plot all too much. I think it is canon, like storyline wise, yeah. but I think what we're seeing right now with the current games is kind of utilizing the concepts it introduced in new ways. Um, and kind of like, say, showing it on the flip side. Because <laughs> yeah. a big mechanic in Ruin is, like, Cassie, like, goes into, like, an AR world and, like, can go through, like, glitched objects to essentially teleport, which is how yeah. you move around in FNAF world. No, that's and, a great point. And, like, she gets deeper and deeper and deeper down into the pizza plex until she gets to the Red Lake and then goes further and then disables the security and then encounters the final antagonist. Which is exactly like how FNAF World works. You disable the security I, system and meet the final boss. I never connected the fact that the lake in Ruin is red. Yeah. Yeah, it's a red lake and it has oh, dead trees no. surrounding it. Huh. Yeah. And it and then like uh Old Man Consequences in Help One and Two, he's like He's at the pizza place, essentially. Like, this is where, like, the final princess quest is. And Old Man Consequences is yeah. right there. The Red Lake is physically present in the sinkhole. And I think the Red Lake at the bottom of the sinkhole is, like, 
kind of like the surface level like version of the deepest layer uh, of the subtunnels. Yeah, and that would make sense. It's really, really interesting. And there there's a lot yeah. of other weird FNAF world connections that the current games have. Like Vanny like matches the white rabbit enemy uh, in FNAF world. Uh, yeah. Mimic and the Mimic Ball. <laughs> mimic Ball, baby. I love the Mimic Ball. He's just a little orange guy. <laughs> and he's also the major antagonist of Five Nights at Freddy's. That's right. <laughs> put, put, put some respect on his name. Put some respect <laughs> on his name. <laughs> oh, my guy, Mimic Ball. And, um, and again, the Mexus console and then security, the security owl in FNAF World. Like, same thing yeah. there. And, uh, the you know and and there's an the enemy console. called the tangle in fnaf world and then we have the tangle yep. <laughs> in security breach and ruin speaking of the mexus console i want to get your thoughts on something have you ever seen the movie war games i have not so let me pull up before i just straight up lie to you <laughs> uh, let me pull up by just being wrong um let me pull up the so it's a movie from 1983 Huh? Um, about <laughs> essentially, <laughs> sorry, I can know myself. Um, essentially, uh, I don't want the whole plot. I want the real quick two paragraph, like two sentence synopsis. If I remember correctly, essentially, the U.S. creates a. Here it is. It's the U.S. creates a supercomputer known as Whopper or the War Operation Plan Planned Response to continuously run war simulations over time so that it, it'll just always run these programs, learn more and more and more, and then give out the best advice for war, essentially. Mm -hmm. And the U.S. wants to give control over their, uh, like, wartime response systems to this machine. Um, and the plot of the game is, like, this kid kind of hacks into it by accident and starts to notice that it's going to set the whole world into a nuclear war if it keeps going the way it does. And eventually this kid directs the computer to play tic-tac-toe against itself until it realizes it will always do a draw, forcing the computer to learn no-win scenarios and stop what it's about to do. So, it, like, it's tricking the computer to lie to itself, essentially. Mm. This is notable for one very important reason. One, I'm sure you can always pick already pick up some of the things I'm putting down. This is what the machine Whopper looks like. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's just the yeah, Mexus console. It's just the Mexus console. <laughs> <laughs> Down to the lights on the machine. <laughs> yeah, it's even like in the same spot too. In the same spot, the same lights. It is like, and notably, this is technology from a movie set in like the 70s, 80s. Interesting. So it opens up so many, like, and the, the uh, I think the movie is set in, hold on, uh, ba ba ba. I don't know if they directly state when it's set in, but like, they're still using dial up, and the movie came out in 83. So, like, it's, it's very much of its time. So, it's one of those things that, like, when I saw Maxis, I'm like, this looks familiar. And then I rewatched this movie, and I was like, oh. <laughs> oh. And it, so I, it I, even has like the same kind of naming convention, like yeah, Whopper, four letters Mexus. right on the machine. That's so it's so and, and now notably Whopper doesn't necessarily have like an entity. It kind of develops a, a, a pseudo personality throughout the movie. Yeah, but I, it doesn't really have a counterpoint uh, or a, a connection to the entity we see in. Um, yeah, ruin. If anything, Whopper sounds more like kind of like how the mimic is. Yeah, I think it would be a better analogy for the mimic, where it's this thing it's kind of that like is specifically built to learn. Or split Whopper into like two separate things, where it's like the mimic endoskeleton and then the Mexus console. Yeah, which then introduces ideas of well, if they leaned on, because I can, this has to be an inspiration. There's no shot accidentally they did that. So if they're leaning on war games for inspiration, that does kind of color uh, interpretations of the mimic. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I needed to talk to another, I, I brought it up in, I think like a previous podcast at some point, And I never got to like have a conversation about this thing. I'm like, I'm not crazy. Look at this. Yeah, machine. No, that, that's, just, <laughs> that's just right there. <laughs> um, that's so crazy. what's the second row? 
I'm okay. very curious. Let's get let's get into into the rabbit hole. Yeah. So here I have like essentially an abridged cut of underneath one that has three important motifs because I have some okay. surprise like bonuses that I haven't that weren't in the first uh, row. Um, okay. So here we have underneath one. Right. So those three like motifs you hear, like the main yeah. three, play pretty much sequentially in FNAF 6. So we have Nowhere to Run again. And then we have the credits music, which matches the bass line of Underneath. Yeah, no, I hear that. And then the last one. Plays in isoptrophobia in Ultimate Custom Night. I find huh. that really interesting because I think that kind of tells like sort of the bridge between FNAF 6 and Ultimate Custom Night where it's like now that now that everything's been burned we are like diving into like the sub tunnels underneath and yeah and we are taken to Ultimate Custom Night which I think is probably like the same kind of realm either like closer to the mainline FNAF universe, or it could very well be in like the same level as FNAF world itself, but it's, it's Fred bear's domain. It's golden Freddy's domain. And yeah. they've orchestrated this to torture William. And both games have like the full, like ensemble of characters for the most part. And generally feel very similar to each other and i've i've always i've for a long time have linked the idea of like ultimate custom and fnaf world yeah. possibly taking place simultaneously or at least being things that happen as a result of the fire of fnaf 6 um i think there's a lot of good evidence to connect them frankly i think now this might be overstepping i don't want to put words in your mouth um but i i do believe that FNAF world in the same vein of ultimate custom night is sort of a manifestation, say what you will, um, by Charlotte to kind of assist those who need help moving on. Um, and the main reason I think that from ultimate custom night, the, uh, marionettes death lines of like, I don't hate you, but you're in my way. The others are animals. I am aware that idea of like, Hey, I'm look, you're preventing things from moving on. I need to help this. But regardless, that that uh, that sequential motif is very interesting. Yeah. And in general, like with like the the flip side under account and seeing how these motifs are so closely associated with Henry, I have a hunch that Henry is old man consequences. I, I've seen, I've seen theories of that before and I've yet to see really compelling evidence for it. I think this motif helps to bolster that argument. Yeah. And you're going to have to roll with me on this next one because this I'm next willing. one is going to inform this, like this, thought of okay. like Henry old man consequences, but sure. 
th th this is the one I'm like anxious about because I'm going to sound insane to most people. I'm I here think. for it. Hey, I just made three videos in a row saying that Elizabeth dies first. I'm used to it. I'm ready for it. <laughs> Hit me with it. Oh, that is crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Understandable. <laughs> anyway, but in all seriousness, so let's go back to Alchemist Fantasy for a moment. If it slowed down there. Yeah. Because I am almost certain that void from Ultimate Custom Night, the cutscene of Golden Freddy, like, fading into the void, is Alchemist Fantasy. If not, that's really fucking close. The second half is a little harder because this note specifically is not the same, like at all. Yeah. But I think I think Void is able to get away with it because it's like so like somber and like deteriorated almost. Right. So almost I think it's got that in a room. more finale, almost like with a more of a sense of finality. Yeah. And what I find so interesting about that is that Void like plays for Golden Freddy and Alchemist Fantasy plays for the puppet. And then we have yeah. Gracefully Into the Abyss, which is explicitly Alchemist Fantasy and plays like for the Golden Princess, who at one point in the files was named Cassidy. Obviously, there's a lot of like right. debate on if that's true, like if if that's canon or if it was like right. a flub. I personally think the princess is Cassidy, and we'll get to that. So we have we have we have this motif here relating to the puppet specifically to Charlotte. Yeah. Uh, but then it's also tied directly to Cassidy. And then we have like, what I assume to be Henry's motif also involved in this. And then in princess quest, the dynamic with like old man consequences and the princess seems to be the princess and the king. Um, yeah, it's like, you could probably make an argument like, Oh no, old man consequences isn't the king. I think it makes the most sense I think that he is. And yeah, also, I think there is like a good, I think like an even better argument than like, cause I, I know I, I said in the past that I've been hesitant on Henry old man consequences. I've never been as hesitant as, or I, I've never been as hesitant to the idea of linking uh, the old King and old man consequences. I think that is a very solid, yeah. that that's super solid to me. Yeah. And he's just straight up named like OMC and Help Wanted Two's files. I'm pretty exactly. sure. Exactly. Like that. Like it's like not in like the color scheme, the the role, like that. That makes sense. Yeah. And I find it really interesting because with the dynamic, the potential dynamic of the king and the princess, that suggests a father and a daughter. And that like begs the question: like, are Cassidy and Charlotte the same person? <laughs> and my answer to that is kind of, they're kind of the same person, but not quite. <laughs> uh, I do need you to elaborate I on will. kind of. That's a wild answer. It is a <laughs> wild answer, but I hit my desk by accident. Um, it, it, it's, it's crazy, but yeah. Golden Freddy's spirit is very, very strange because... I agree. There is always this like twisted narrative with it where we're not entirely sure what goes down with them. Cause like we have give gifts, give life where the puppet is yeah. putting the masks on each child to like let them possess each animatronic. And then after that, the last child just 
appears on the screen and Golden Freddy jump scares you. Like the puppet yeah. does not put anyone in Golden Freddy. There is no fifth kid there, but there is. Um, like there is one. Yeah. And and then like uh, in the movie we have like obviously a a marginally different a set different of kids. yeah marginally different set of kids. But Golden Freddy specifically is treated very similarly. And he even looks, like, near identical to the Vengeful Spirit's, like, face in Ultimate Custom Night. I agree. Like, and they styled his hair the same of... way, and he has, like, the same relationship with Afton, from what we can tell. Yeah. And is given a sort of ringleader status. Yeah. And... Uh, which which then parallels uh, pretty well with Michael from the... Er, sorry, yeah, Michael from the books. Yes. The idea of, like, Golden Freddy coming out and stopping things. And then... In the movie... On the drawing of the yellow rabbit with the kids, the Golden Freddy's kid's face is taped over someone else's. I need to look this up. Yeah. I believe you, but I've never seen that, so I yeah. just need to real quick. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look at that, too. <laughs> when I googled FNAF movie yellow rabbit drawing, the first oh. ten results were people drawing. There it is. Okay, here we go. Yeah. Yep, it's taped over. And then... In, yeah, that is like a cut out piece of paper on top of it. And then in Abby's drawing of the yellow rabbit killing the kids, she draws Garrett and not the Golden Freddy kid. Like, that child is completely absent from her drawing. And I find that very interesting. That's crazy. Because she she directly interacted with this kid, but she still, like, chose Garrett and not him. And that makes me think, especially under, like, the theory that when the second FNAF movie comes out, we're going to see that Garrett has become the puppet. Um, yeah. So this is kind of, like, theory off of theory. Sure. But... I mean, that that's FNAF. But, like, it, it, it helps with, like, demonstrating my line of thinking. Um, mm -hmm. But I think we're going to, like, potentially see that... What Golden Freddy's spirit is, is like a fractal almost of the puppet spirit. And potentially they could also be linked with a physical fifth child that was murdered during the missing children's sure. incident. But the narrative with that has been so strange that it's very possible that there just wasn't. And in universe, everyone just assumes there was. And, and also like with the Charlie trilogy in mind, it's like, it's not the first, this wouldn't be the first time like Charlie's death has been like tampered with by history. Fair. Cause like, uh, she has like, Afton took her, but then it's like, oh, he took Sammy. And then it's like, nope, you died here. <laughs> and Sammy's perfectly fine, but no one knew about this. And it's like, I think a similar case could be. Like, to hear just a different situation, but yeah, semi-comparable. and That's really interesting. And to kind of bring this together, because it's not just sure. the music connecting them. Lefty is really, really weird. Because Lefty feels like a combination yeah. of the puppet and Golden Freddy. And also, Lefty is in a very way, strange. reflects Nightmare. Nightmare, and in a way... Looks real, looks and acts like a fun time. Uh, lefty to the point, hair. lefty to the point where even the fact of like the idea of uh, an animatronic built to capture something. Yeah, and additionally, I think William is the person who designed the puppet and the security puppet. Uh, sorry, you cut out there for me. What was oh, that? sorry. Um, I think William is the person who designed the puppet and the security puppet. Interesting. We differ there, but I see I see where you're coming from. So the reason I think this is we is when you look at like the toys, the fun times, the security puppet, they they all have like a consistent design trait where they're like very smooth like plastic or like metal. They have like mm -hmm. their hard exteriors with like the rosy cheeks, usually like slimmer builds, uh and and like are much more of a clown aesthetic 
and William is yeah. like very clown like oriented. Like there's even William is a clown. Job. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> like, like he makes a whole underground bunker full of clowns. <laughs> yeah, no, William loves his clowns. And I, that 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 is a fact. And like one of the weirdest things when FNAF two came out was like, what on earth is the puppet? That's not an animal. That's a weird clown sock monkey thing. <laughs> yeah, it's like puppet puppet and balloon boy were the weirdest ones because they were like human, but even balloon they, they, boy feels yeah they were more weird normal than the puppet does. I I, I did make the claim at some point that. Oh, sorry. We, we we both cut out there for a oh. second. What was that? Uh, but even Balloon Boy feels more natural than the puppet does. Fair. And I did make the claim that it. I would even go as far to argue that Balloon Boy may have as well been a, a holdover from somewhere else as like the Withers were and the puppet was for FNAF 2. That's very possible. Uh, the, the idea of Balloon Boy being a holdover from what was going to be Circus Baby's Pizza World. Yeah, I, I think Balloon Boy easily could have been a much earlier character than, like, he appears in FNAF 2. Like, I think yeah. he existed well beforehand. And especially, it like, does. It seems like FNAF 2 was like, all right, what do we still have in the company? Bring it in. Like, yeah. and, and especially, like, with the movie in mind, like, the little Balloon Boy toy that's just, like, right. littered everywhere. All over the place and for like, no reason. And, and in AR, he's, like, grouped in with the classics and Springtrap and Circus Baby. Like... He, he's, like, considered kind of, like, one of the core members of the cast. Uh, yeah, which is very strange for what is ostensibly a clown child with a balloon. Yeah. Like, and then, and then FNAF He doesn't 4, have the white makeup, have, but he still like, has those rosy cheeks. You have the three toys that the little girl has, and then a mangle doll, like, in presumably yep. Elizabeth's room. and her- Which... If we're going off of book logic, which I, I think mangle should be Toy Foxy. However... If we're going off of the books here, that would technically be a fun time in her room. Uh, let's not worry about that because <laughs> that's a tricky subject that I do not really care about that much. <laughs> Fair. Um, but essentially, I think the toys probably yeah. existed as characters like a good while before FNAF 2 happened. I think I agree. I think that's a safe bet. I yeah. think the reason they're called the toy animatronics is that's how the toys had looked for some time. Yeah. And it's like, okay, well, let's just bring the toys to life, quote unquote. Yeah. And like they have like a lot of markers of like Williams sort of design philosophy that we see. Like Bonnie is a very light blue, like Bon Bon and Toy Bonnie. And I mean, I also further think evidence that for Rocks are also part of Williams design philosophy. And Glamrock Bonnie falls in there completely nicely because he's also a very light blue. Fair. I mean, further evidence of that idea in the Into the Pit trailer, we see in the background posters of Balloon Boy, Circus Baby, and what look like Toy Bonnie in what should be a 1985 Freddy Fazbear's. That's interesting. I I haven't looked at the Into the Pit stuff in a while because I've just been waiting for the game to like be properly shown. So I, yeah, the the, so the trailer kind of that like, got put out. Yeah, yeah, the trailer that got put out. Now, granted, there's also a poster of Freddie in like a basketball outfit. So, like, <laughs> say so, so what you will, you know, it could just be an Easter listen, egg. But there listen, is gonna a be poster the first skin when FNAF AR makes its comeback. True, <laughs> FNAF AR two coming this summer. Um, um, I will say we're running a bit long. Is there any other music specific motifs you wanted to cover so we don't miss them? Uh, no, no, that's everything. Okay. Now, now we're in the it was thick a really of, like, interesting my stuff. theory stuff with Golden Freddy and Lefty and Puppet. And okay. Yeah. So and I, I do, I see where you're coming from on that. I like, yeah. I, I don't know if I am on your ship, but I like seeing it pass by. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, it, it's an interesting thought, the idea of the almost, almost like a fractured self. Cause I, I had been for a while considering what characters and what like things we see in these games are um, the same or at least reflections of themselves. Like I'd been saying for a long time, the idea of shadow Bonnie and shadow Freddie being um, agony reflections of Charlie and Cassidy respectively. Hmm. Um, With the idea of shadow Bonnie uh, kind of being more of a protector from what we see in like FNAF world, FNAF AR, that role of like 
the only time Shadow Bonnie is aggressive that we know of is protecting someone from collecting remnant, like stopping them from doing mm -hmm. that. Versus Shadow Freddy, which like FNAF World, the moves of Shadow Freddy are insta kills. And follow me, Shadow Freddy is leading the animatronics to their death. So it's like it seems like Shadow Freddy is more of a aggressor yeah. kind of role. Um so I, I I'm not a str I'm not a stranger or opposed to the idea of fragmenting a character in separate ways, um, yeah. and I th I think the I I think the motif explanation the motif obviously not being the only evidence for this idea that you have, um, I think it is a good um, piece of evidence for it. I guess a counter argument to challenge that, if this motif is showing up for Golden Freddy the puppet and Henry, could this also be explained as a motif? of resistance to William Afton. That is possible. But Alchemist Fantasy, to my knowledge, appears so rarely, I think it's a character specific sort of thing. And that is fair. I, I guess if it was it doesn't just resistance for the to William. Henry songs, Henry's motif appears in like it and, and gracefully into the yeah. And I think that's kind of like because Cassidy and Old Man Consequences are both playing an active role. That's a fair point. Yeah. And uh, on the topic of Lefty, before I forget, uh, sure. the way they like, the way they move is very similar to like the very erratic, like broken sort of movement Golden Freddy like gets in FNAF AR. And, and like they have the one missing eye like Golden Freddy has in the movie and in that one promotional render where he just has one glowing eye for some reason <laughs> um fair and like in their uh rare screen they're slumped over with their mouth agape just like golden freddy which you could argue for that like the slumped over thing is just because all of them are slumped over in the renders which is completely fair i think it's definitely trying to hearken to golden freddy a, a little bit i think so it could be I wrong um, you know, speaking of parallels, and this is definitely nothing, it's more of like a, an interesting thematic idea, not a piece of evidence for any kind of theory. It's interesting, you could argue, that in using Lefty in this way, Henry is doing to Charlie what William did to the missing kids. The idea of taking something and putting it inside of this animatronic suit. It's an interesting, like, good versus evil foil of their characters. Yeah. And and to add on to, like, the Henry-William dynamic thing, I also think sure. that if Henry's daughter is, like, fractures into, like, s kind of like their own independent spirit because of mm -hmm. what William did, that's, in a way, in a twisted sort of way, William and Henry's together, their child, and it's Fred Bear, it's Golden Freddy, and I think that could be a really interesting, like, dynamic character concept, whatever you want to call it. That that is interesting, and and it's not something I ever really put much thought into before I started like thinking about this. Like, oh, that's why Golden Freddy's like as important as they are, because it's literally like yeah, and hmm. it. It's a lot, and I I don't think I've covered everything I can cover about it, but I think I've got like the bulk of it to where yeah, like, people no, it's can an interesting see thought. why I'm thinking it. At least see where you're coming yeah. from, right? Okay. No, it's an interesting thought, and and I also think it's the sort of thing where it's like we don't presently have enough information to be able to make a full conclusion about it, one way or another. Sure. So I, I think yeah we I think are this definitely is more of a as always theory. Yeah, and we are as always in a limbo of information. Yeah, where like uh, it, like I, I mentioned in this past week's video of like I wanted to like okay now let's place the games in the timeline and even doing something like that it's like all right well here's fifteen minutes of information that isn't in any game that we just kind of have to base off of a speculation off of a theory off of a speculation. Um, cause that is FNAF. Like yeah. if for the, for the, for the foreseeable future, that's Five Nights at Freddy's is doing your best with something like that. Um, no, that is interesting. And it would also kind of, yeah, huh. I, I hadn't thought about it that way. It's, it's weird. It's really weird, but I feel like it's the right kind of weird that like 
Yeah. It can realistically happen in this series. And I think, like, the way it plays into, like, the characters in the story, like, makes enough sense to where it doesn't seem like just a leap for the sake of being a leap. Which everyone might disagree with me on that. Yeah. And that's fine. But this is where my brain is currently. And I think it's really interesting. I see it. It's it's an interesting space to play inside of, right? Yeah. It's one of those things where, like, even if 10 years later it comes out that something like this isn't true, working in this space and experimenting with what that would change is so valuable, right? Yeah. Because, like I, like, like, I, like I mentioned earlier, the whole Elizabeth dies first thing. Do I think, like, if I could make one final theory for the rest of my life and I had to stick to it, would I put Elizabeth's death first? Not really. Because <laughs> I think there's too many problems with it. But currently, I like working in that space to see what it could reveal about the timeline. Yeah. Uh, that's interesting. Yeah, I I like that. I, we, I, have, I, I feel like that's a good, like, end yeah. for the, the topic for today. But I've held you for two hours. I don't know if I want to force you to answer questions now. I, I uh, do you want to rapid don't fire mind. some? I, I don't even mind. All right. I can do this all let's, day. Let's <laughs> I know we've been going for a bit, but we will touch on a couple questions because uh, we're, we're keeping the, the brainstorms going. So if you have questions you want answered on the podcast, you can either submit them on Spotify directly or you can send them to Freddy Fazbear Pizza Podcast at gmail.com. That address is on screen and in the description because it is a painted type. So just copy and paste it. Trust me, it'll make your life easier. In case we don't get to all of them, let me see if I can start with a spicy one. Um, or at least one that kind of links up to what we've been talking about. Bird Trap is really going to have to. <laughs> yeah, I think that'll be a fun one. I think that's the spiciest one we've got. Um, so this one's from King Landon. He, him. Thank you for your question. I've been wondering for a while, what do you think is the true identity of Glitch Trap slash Burn Trap slash The Mimic? Do you think that they are actually William Afton, a recreation of William, or simply a different entity altogether? Thank you for your question, King Landon. I think the best part about this question is it said glitch trap slash burn trap slash the mimic as one singular entity, <laughs> which is great because I would argue those were three characters you just said. <laughs> now that's I, an I, interesting. I've half a mind to say none of them are the same. That's an interesting take. It's not one I share. Uh, well. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give you the floor. We'll what what are your what are your takes on? I guess we'll take them one at a time. I think is the best way to go about this, right? Because if I dump, all right. So what's your opinion on that whole question? That's gonna be that's rough. Yeah. Let's let's take these one at a time. Start off. I think an easy way to start: glitch trap, burn trap, the mimic. Are they the same person? No. Are they the same thing? No. Where would you draw those lines? What what are you separating here? So for me. Glitch Trap and Burn Trap are a little bit different, but I, I can get to that later because that's a little more sure. nuanced. I think the Mimic is something else entirely. Could have a little bit of overlap in terms of like how Glitch Trap came to be, but I do not sure. think the Mimic was ever the intended like antagonist of the current games until Ruin. I I, I think people have like this this idea in their heads that like, the mimic exists to be a plot twist for the sake of a plot twist. And the reason it exists is to mimic William. But like in the actual usage we see of it, it is consistently its own entity and doesn't ever get presented with that much overlap besides like the epilogues kind of teasing, Oh, could it be burn trap? And then it drops it. And then could it be burn trap? It drops it. Yeah, and it has like it has like a similar hand, but it's a very like noticeably edited version of Burn Trap's hand. It has added joints, like joint connectors on the palm. The palms, mm -hmm. uh, wider. The whole the whole of the metal it's, it's is an amalgamation. way wider, rather yeah. than the like like black metal that Burn Trap's hand has. It is very clearly put together from something. It feels like there's a lot of intentional misdirects with the mimic, but I don't mm -hmm. think it actually is burn trap. And uh, a lot of people probably know that I, that I used to think that the mimic was the endoskeleton and William was the body. Mm -hmm. I think burn trap is literally just as he appears to be. 
and the mimic's just not involved. I I, th- I was in the same boat um, where f- at first I was like, okay, somehow the flesh has been stripped from Burn Trap and we have what's left. And, and nowadays I do I think I think that I think at least Burn Trap and the mimic definitely separate entities is where I'm at. Yeah. Because I think. Um, I think a, a big part of the reason I think that besides like other thematic elements, as far as like hard evidence goes, I think the whole like because um, we see with the ventilation shaft to the mimics room being collapsed and Gregory's bag this we see this scene being played out of like Gregory luring the mimic in that room, getting it trapped and sneaking out with presumably the help of Vanessa. I think that doesn't happen after security breach. I think that makes the most sense happening before security breach when Gregory is still GGY. Yeah. And that being said, if that's true, then definitely the mimic and burn trap are two different things. Yeah. If, if they lured the mimic to that room after the events of security breach, that's when things can get dubious because it's like, so where was burn trap? Why was he not a threat? Yeah. Where was the blob? How did they get back there safely? Like that's crazy. Which, in my opinion, I think the Mimic has been trapped in that specific room for a long time, as Gregory said. Uh, and I don't feel like the time between security end of Security Breach, beginning of Ruin, is long enough for Gregory to talk about the Mimic the way he did. Um, yeah. It's like, I don't and, know what it is, but it's been down there a really long time. Exactly. Same with the Mexus. I mean, you look at the Mexus machine, it's rusted to hell. Yeah. The Mexus machine is old. Yeah. Way older than anything else in there. Like older than the computer in there, older than the forklift in there. Way older than the uh the ruin like wrench puzzle thing that's in there. Um and you could say the same thing about the mimic being like sure it's not like technically as rusty I guess, but the machinery on it does look older. Mm-hmm. And and if you um, take into account like the epilogues, it's like uh the mimic's brought there before the pizza plex is even finished being constructed. And then yeah. is killed off at the end. And either that could be just separate continuity or it just gets fixed at some point between the epilogues right. and security breach. And I think that paints an interesting picture where I think the mimic was probably out of commission for the bulk of the pizza plexus lifespan. And there were probably traces of like its AI, like within like their systems and stuff and like, Glitchtrap, I think, was able to, like, come forth because of the Mimic 1 program, potentially. Uh, Sure. Mostly because I think the Mimic 1 program's kind of just pretty simple. (laughs) Yeah. No, I I I, do agree that I think it's less complicated than people make it out to be. Um, Yeah, I I think I do agree generally that, like, not to put words in your mouth, I believe in the idea of, like, at least personally, like, Glitchtrap being... Um, the Mimic One program versus the Mimic Endoskeleton, which uh, have learned in separate environments for so long, right? And and to to continue off of that, I I don't think Glitchtrap is the Mimic One program itself. I think okay. it is Afton's spirit, like tethering itself to that program. And okay. Like, I see that. And you could give or take, like, take or leave the Mimic 1 part. He might just be a virus in, like, the Help Wanted VR game without Mimic 1 involved. Mm-hmm. But it's, like, taking it into account, I think that's the explanation. Uh, sure. And I, I do like, I, I like the idea of William being there, um, especially because it bolsters my current thinking that uh, the felt suits were William's direct creations and Henry translated them. Um, which would help with the idea that Glitchtrap presents itself as a felt suit character. Yeah, and it's like, uh, the thing about Glitchtrap is like, he he acts far too nostalgic. And like, and like Pizza Party is kind of like him giving you a whole high, highlight reel of the missing children's incident and his whole past, essentially. And I don't think the Mimic has that kind of commitment in it especially not for a different guy who has never been stated to have ever the mimic to have ever been associated with or interested in. Yeah. Like there, there, there was that narrative for a while. Like people were saying like, Oh, the mimic saw the missing children's incident. The book said so. And then you read the book and it said, it must have seen some game of hide and seek or something. Yeah. Like it's implied, <laughs> like maybe it saw something, but like it didn't, like, it never mentioned a specific sighting. 
And, and like, specifically the usage of hide-and-seek is, like, the missing children's incident is not comparable to hide-and-seek at all. Like, Afton just no. walked up to them and it's like, hey, follow me. And they're like, okay. <laughs> yeah, and, and that's, speaking of, like, the idea of, like, follow me, like, um, it, it's, like you said, it's, like, it's a more of, like, it, it would be one thing if it was, oh, maybe he saw a game of, like, follow the leader or something like that. But hide-and-seek specifically is a very different thing. Yeah. Um, and even in the epilogues, the mimic isn't acting like William does necessarily. Like the the mimic is on a. It's very clearly like I have been given instructions to take the uh, the uh, the limbs and head off of these things and put them in a pile. Mm -hmm. There are new things. I need to go do that. It is very like cold calculating. And sure, there is the the aggression that came from the idea of like possibly the beating it received in the ep and the in the story the mimic. But then we get the idea of like is the epilogue mimic even majority same from the mimic we see in that story? Because in the story the mimic you get the description of it, and then in the epilogues it's a charred thing with a fresh new head and rabbit ears. And. Al like, it, it, those are, that, something happened. <laughs> yeah. And, and alongside that is, like, I th I think a lot of the Mimic's aggression is not even, like, out of malicious intent, but because that's just all it knows at this point. Sure. Yeah, I, I would argue Kelly's murder is not a malicious or aggressive thing. It was, oh, a suit. Let me go put this on. And then they're just oh, something was in here weird in there. And yeah. I, I, I think the Mimic is, like, very, like... It's still evil, but in sure. in kind of like a childlike sort of way where it's like it, it doesn't really know any better and it hasn't been given yeah. a chance to. So if it's given instructions, it like is like, oh, I need to do this task. And then it's also traumatized by Edwin beating it to a pulp. And it's like, yeah. And so it can just skew its instructions to be like, OK, rip off limbs and head of endoskeleton. Rip off you got it, limbs boss. and heads. <laughs> Easy peasy. And <laughs> um, no, I, I yeah. fully agree with that. And, um, and Glitch Trap so, just acts far too Afton like for me to be like, oh, yeah, that's totally the Mimic. Because it's just it's just not. And Mimic does not commit to bits that hard. Like when it's yeah. communicating to Cassie as Gregory, he he he's he doesn't try to match Gregory's personality at all. He, he's just not like, even a little. Cassie, he's he's Cassie, got the voice get, and that's it. Get, Come on, come on, hurry up, gig. Come on, I'm I'm in the sinkhole under the raceway. Come on, it, it, help, help. What are you What are you doing? Come on. And, and then I will say the latter third of this question, I think we just shake hands with is, uh, what do you think Burn Trap is? I think I, I I believe is just I shake your hand and say it's Scrap Trap after the fire. No. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, what is it then? I'm very curious. I think Burn Trap is. Essentially, Glitch Trap's ideal form in the physical world. And I think okay. the reason that ending isn't canon is because he hasn't accomplished that yet. Potentially. Okay. I could see that. Because I do understand. I'm sorry, go on. And, and one thing to note about it is that his charging pod in Ruin is cleaner than it is in base security breach. Yes. That's what I was going to yeah. mention that. So, yeah. And... Um, and his endoskeleton is a specific combination of glamrock parts and springlock parts. And, and there's been a lot of discourse lately, like, oh, he's just a lazy asset flip. And it's like, no, no, he's not. The Burn Trap is a very intentionally crafted design. And even though he seems unassuming, I think every little bit of him is important. Um, And, and I think yeah. ultimately his endoskeleton is crafted with like new glamrock parts and the remains of like spring traps endoskeleton and i could see that yeah because i do it does seem that burn trap was made that way yeah um and like i do I, I do see the idea of like maybe vanessa or another peon of glitch trap being like okay the the concept will be you will make this yeah and like he even has like modified glamrock feet to have like uh, five toes instead of four, or four toes yeah. instead of three, or what, the, whatever yeah, the, it has. the glam rock number. However many, the correct number. <laughs> <laughs> the the correct number. He has one more than they do. Uh, 
And so, like, they, they, they went into his endoskeleton and made specific changes to accommodate for what they wanted him to look like. Yeah. And also his hands are, like, brand new. Resembled nightmare parts, but are completely original hands. And and then his suit is, like, bolted together. There's, like, barely any of it left. Uh, yeah, it's like any possible remaining memorabilia we can find has been grafted to this. Yeah, and it's, like... And, like, when you look at him from the back, it's, like, all of his suit parts are, like, bolted onto him. And his flesh is growing into it. And yeah. And for a while I was thinking, like, oh, did he grow the suit? I don't think he did. I think the suit is supposed to be, like, the remnants of Springtrap. Uh, and... Like, whatever was left Yeah, whatever was fire. left of Springtrap. And I personally think Scraptrap is a different suit. So, okay. Burn Trap looking like Spring Trap again instead of Scrap Trap, I think makes perfect sense canonically because I think it's all intentionally different. Um, Fair. And like when you when you look at Burn Trap's corpse, it's like he, his body is more of like a nervous system or a circulatory system rather than like the mangled organs that Spring Trap and Scrap Trap had. And like you look at like the gash in his forehead and his. And, like, his head is, like, growing into the rabbit ear. There's, like, veins, yeah. like, in the suit. The The whole thing is just so, like, organic and weird. And I I, I personally think that he just straight up was was cooking up in that pod. <laughs> and, Interesting. And people, people don't really like that theory very much, but I think it's the most sensible conclusion to make based on his design. And we also have stuff like in the flesh where like an organic spring trap grows in this guy's stomach <laughs> and fair and like in the frights epilogues, like Afton's spirit, like, like grows itself into like this amalgamation of flesh before it like comes together in the trash heap. That is the agony. So I think there's like, that's interesting. I think there is like precedent already for him to like kind of regrow his body into like the ideal spring trap, essentially. Interesting. And that's why his teeth are like all blocky and huge for some reason. And like why sure. his skull is like molded into the spring trap mask rather than the mask being like plenty big enough to fit like anyone's head inside. It's like molded to him. Yeah. Cause like, like we mentioned, the size is very important there. Like he is, he is huge. Yeah. He is gigantic. Um, he looks like a nightmare animatronic, and I think he wants to be, like, the monster spring trap. I think my current thinking of it has been the idea of, okay, FNAF 6 fire burns away the remnant remaining within scrap trap, and then whatever is there is kind of primarily agony, right? Uh, and then whatever machinery is still left behind, then when eventually... Um, Vanessa and possibly Gregory, who knows, uh, are directed by Glitchtrap to go down there and retrieve it. It's like, okay, get as much Afton as you can, put it in a pod, make it as much of a real thing as you can, add parts to it. I want a good body and you need to make it for me. Yeah. So same, same like, m I guess, motive between us, but different means and different method of glitch trap wanting an ideal body yes and another thing was like how the little we see of burn trap and security breach since that like entire final section of the game was like made in like two weeks uh, yeah it's like um the what little we see of him he gregory gets down there with freddy and and burn trap comes out of the pod like looking like he was, like, asleep almost. And then, like, his yeah. lights come on, and he, like, angrily, like, claws at the, the pod, steps out, and hacks Freddy. And then he sends out the other animatronics to attack Gregory instead of doing it himself. And that's a mm -hmm. very Afton thing to do. Because Afton, like, oh, yeah. almost always does that if he can, where he'll just send out the animatronics to do his dirty work for him. Because... Generally, he acts terribly under pressure. Like, yeah, he's kind of a piece of shit, like a little bit. <laughs> like, like he cannot think on his feet for the life of him. 
So this toddler, yeah. like, struts into his sinkhole, destroys all his minions, and is about to come for him. And he's like, oh, oh, uh, 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 what do I do? Uh, okay, Freddy's right there. I can hack him finally. Boom. Yeah. And then he's like, everyone else, go get him. Because I think at that point, Burn Trap is too physically frail to be able to deal with Gregory himself. He's not done. He's still yeah, cooking. He's still cooking. Um, and like the way he moves is just like he is a full on zombie. And yeah. And he's quivering, yeah, because in shaking. the idea, in the idea of Glitchrap wanting an ideal body, very clearly what we see of Burn Trap isn't ideal. It's not yeah. done. Yeah, it's like um, it is a complete mess. He looks like a disaster. Yeah, and, but speaking of things that are done, we could do this all day, but unfortunately, I do have to go help take care of my children because uh, <laughs> my wife needs a break. That's um, perfectly so fine. we are going to have to be done today. Uh, but thank you so much. Uh, tell the folks at home where they can find you. Uh, you can find yep. me on my uh, YouTube channel, You've True, and I'm also on Twitter and Tumblr. Uh, Undeniably Canon Part 3 is still in Huge. the works. Uh, slowly. Executive dysfunction's really fun. <laughs> uh, I tr- I 100% get yeah. that. <laughs> I fully I'm in that boat. I feel you. And I'm also part of the part of the reason on, I've been Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Uh, I'm, I'm No, no, you go. And I'm also currently working on a FNAF World randomizer video. So that'll be Huge. more of a casual sort of thing to put out semi soon sick yeah I, I was part of the reason i've been streaming my editing is because like if i make 20 people look at me while i'm working i can't not work <laughs> <laughs> it's a way to force myself to edit uh <laughs> yeah um yeah but uh, this has been great um yeah. I, I i would love to have you on again uh obviously at some point um yeah, but anytime you folks... want to have me just ask <laughs> Yeah, for sure. I mean, I'll do my best. We had that whole, I'm not good at that, but I'll do yeah. my best. Um, but uh, this has been the Freddy Fazbear Pizza Podcast, where the pizza abilities are endless. Uh, we hope to enjoy your future patronage. Bye-bye for now. Bye-bye.